بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome you all to our first lesson in the book القواعد المثلى في صفات الله وأسمائه الحسنى for the Imam الشيخ محمد ابن صالح ابن عثيمين رحمة الله تعالى عليه The book is called in English The Exemplary Principles Pertaining Allah's Attributes and Names And of course we all do know the rank of Sheikh ibn Uthaymin rahmatullahi alayhi and how much contributions that he had presented uh, to serve the ummah. In fact, if you look around today, for every student of knowledge who is upon the Quran and the Sunnah, according to the understanding of the righteous predecessors, you would find that he has benefited immensely from the lessons of Sheikh ibn Uthaymin Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi Be it in aqeedah or fiqh or hadith or ulum al-ala The sciences which are the prerequisites for the uh, ulum al-ghaya Which is the Quran and the Sunnah like the usul al-fiqh uh, Mustalah al-hadith, lugh al-arabi and so on So you would not find a person But he had benefited from him directly or indirectly uh, In fact I remember when, when I was in Yemen You would find people living in a very remote villages in which four-wheel drive cars can hardly reach these areas. And you'll find students of knowledge listening to the tapes of Sheikh ibn Uthaymin rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. So may Allah benefit us by his knowledge and may Allah bestow his mercy upon him and may Allah make us and him gather us all with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi and his companion in Al-Firdaus al-A'la. So, let us get into the book, but before we get into the book, there is a very important introduction that we as students of knowledge must be aware of. And the issue of the title of this book and the subject of this book. The subject of the book is pertaining Allah's names and attributes. So why is it so important to understand this specific topic? Uh, the reason, one of the reasons is, it is because, because it is uh, one of the types of the Tawheed. The Tawheed is divided into three types. It's uh, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, wa Tawheed al-Asma'i al-Sifat. So, al-Asma'i al-Sifat is one of the uh, types of Tawheed. Hence, it is very important to understand it like we do understand the Tawheed al rububiyya and Tawheed al asma al sifat or Tawheed al uluhiyya And also we, we must uh, attend in our mind that the nobility of a science uh, is achieved because of the nobility of the subject of that science. And the subject of Allah's names and attributes is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, the exalted he is. So this is why <clears throat> knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through his names and attributes the exalted he is so that we should display the due respect that he deserves the exalted he is. Uh, a third issue uh, in which we, we attain by learning the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that it will certainly have an immense impact upon our behavior and how we conduct ourselves in this life in regards of our worship or even our relation amongst each other. So when you see that the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the all hearing, as samir subhanahu wa ta'ala, once you attend this meaning of this great name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he is the all hearing, he hears everything subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will certainly watch over any statement that your mouth may utter in this case. So knowing Allah's name subhanahu wa ta'ala certainly will have a, a good uh, effect upon our behavior and how we conduct ourselves in this life. Uh, another issue 
is, is why do we also need to uh, bring the, the principles that the Sheikh is going to mention in this book pertaining Allah's names and attributes. Uh, we do see that this specific topic, that there are so many, uh, so many groups who had gone astray in dealing with it. So it became incumbent upon Ahl Sunnah, the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, to clarify the, this topic in specific. Because a deviation in this specific topic is not like any other deviation. Once we see that people misinterpret the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, which may convey a wrong meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes, the exalted he is. Here it becomes incumbent upon the scholars to bring people back to the right track, especially if this track was the understood way by the righteous predecessors. And those who had gone astray in this specific topic, they their deviance started way after the time of the Sahaba and uh, the Tabi'een, at the end of the time of the Tabi'een, it started to immense once the Ilm al-Kalam and the influence of the uh, philosophers and the introduction of logic and intellect before the text. From that point and on, we do see some uh, people who are misinterpreting the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is why it becomes incumbent upon us to master this topic, especially these days <clears throat> when we see the groups who had gone astray in this specific topic are working so hard to spread their way of understanding Allah's names and attributes. So we as students of knowledge should be very well equipped with the argument in this specific topic in order to guide the people to the simple and straightforward nature of the verses of the Quran in which any lay person, be it a small boy or a grown-up, would understand. I mean, it's so simple that when you hear the ayah, Allah saying subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa and Harun, إِنِّي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى I am with you hearing and seeing. So any, any regular person who hears these verses would say Allah is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, listening to Musa and Harun, and he is also watching Musa and Harun. This is straightforward. This is the simple language of the Quran that every single person whom his mind was not distorted by the philosophy and the ilm al-kalam uh, would, would understand. So, but what we see is that those people of philosophy and those who put their intellect before the text, they distort the meaning of those uh, attributes and names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and took it to a different direction in which that it becomes very hard upon any lay person to come with that understanding. So this way will certainly lead people to misunderstand the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is more important than the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which he praises himself the exalted he is in a terms and way which is meant to be very simple, very straightforward, but those who put their intellect they made it so complex and so hard upon people to understand the direct meaning. So this is why we, we need to understand the way of Ahl Sunnah when it comes to dealing with Allah's names and attribute. Another issue is that what was the, the reason behind the misguidance of those people from understanding Allah's names and attributes in a manner that befits His Majesty. Uh, especially when we see them introducing a way which the Sahaba were not upon. 
and the imams from the tabi'in were not upon so uh, what what was the, exactly the drive behind them reaching this position when we look uh, you know thoroughly into the issue we see we see that they they exalted the mind and the intellect beyond its uh, uh, right level so they gave precedence for the intellect over the text I mean by the text here is the Quran and the authentic Sunnah and they uh, of course since the the intellect was given this you know high level and precedence over the text they say that the aql is categorical uh, therefore you cannot accuse the aql of mistake uh, unlike they say the text it is non-categorical or inconclusive meaning that it's not qat'i it's a dhanni based on dhan it could imply more than one meaning while the aql is categorical qat'i it once you reach a a, 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 a a level of conviction through evidences that the aql says something you cannot go and oppose the intellect in this regard so again the intellect is qat'i categorical while they say the text the quran the sunnah are dhanni meaning dhanni dalala in its implication so they say it's non-categorical in this regard based on this statement then they uh, have driven so many arguments in which they have dealt with the text of the quran and the sunnah but we as ahl sunnah what is our position for the aql the intellect uh, since the uh, ahlul kalam had gone to a position where they have exalted and gave precedence to the intellect that does not mean that we ahl sunnah neglect the aql the intellect in fact we do see that the aql is manatu taklif the taklif that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the entire uh, quranic discourse is directed to the intellect so that's why they say all the uh, uh, injunctions stated in the quran and the sunnah are directed to the one who has intellect meaning that those who do not have the intellect they are exempted from the injunctions mentioned in the quran and the authentic sunnah so hence the aql has a value in the sharia and the aql is the place in which the discourse of the sharia is directed to meaning that it becomes uh, uh, incumbent upon the one who has intellect to comply with the injunctions of the sharia uh, secondly uh, in, in regard to the how much the sharia had given care to the intellect we see that the aql is among the five necessities which are related to maqasid al-shari'a so the the objective of the sharia of islam is to preserve five things and those five things we see that the entire sharia orbits around which is to preserve the deen the religion and to preserve life and to preserve intellect and to preserve the progeny and to preserve the property so you'll see the entire sharia are uh, set to protect and safeguard those five necessities amongst them is al-aql the intellect this is why we would see that the sharia uh, presenting presenting uh, very stringent uh, laws and rulings pertaining preserving the aql so if somebody consumes intoxicants where he loses he harms his intellect or takes some kind of drugs that harms his intellect the sharia had placed severe punishment uh, against whomever practices such a thing in order to protect the intellect we see also like if someone harms someone 
uh, uh, to an extent where he loses his mind and his intellect. The ruling of the Sharia here is that, that this person is entitled to a full blood money, as if he, has, he had killed him. This is, tells you how much the aql is valued in the Sharia. Also, we do see that the Sharia, especially the Quran and the authentic Sunnah, in many cases, it calls for people to use their intellect and to reflect upon the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and upon the teachings and guidance of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, the, the, uh, that's why you would see in the Quran, so many verses of the Quran ends with أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ so it's all talking to the, uh, the, the people that why aren't you using your intellect to reflect upon the content of the message of the message brought by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Looking to the Quran with your intellect, looking to the teachings of the Prophet peace be upon him, using your intellect to be guided to the truth. So the Sharia is full with such, uh, you know, ayat and a hadith calling to use the intellect in order to be guided to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see the Sharia also praises those who use their intellect. Uh, Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُوا إِلَّا أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ Those who really uh, remember and, and reflect are those with intellect, with minds. So in many cases, the Sharia praises those who are using their intellect uh, to be guided to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, unlike those who are uh, not giving care to their intellect and not reflecting upon the teachings and guidance of the Quran, the Sunnah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispraised uh, such behavior. Allah the Exalted said uh, about Bani Israel, like in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِذَا قِيلَ إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا And if it is said to them, follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent down, they would say, we, all, we shall follow what we have found our forefathers upon. Allah said, أَوَلَوْ كَانَ آبَاءَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ Even if their forefathers were uh, not showing understanding or thinking and using their intellect and not uh, are not guided and then he said وَمَثَلُ الَّذِي يَنْعِقُ بِمَا لَا يَسْمَعُ إِلَّا دُعَاءً وَنِدَاءً صُمٌ بُكْمٌ عُمْيٌ فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ and he gave a parable here and he said their example is like the example of a person or a shepherd who calls loudly over his uh, cattle. Uh, the cattle can nothing can, can understand nothing from his call but the sound. And he uh, described in subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are uh, deaf and dumb and blind. Why? They don't use their intellect. They don't understand in this regard. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispraised for not using the intellect. This is this tells you how important the aql is in the sharia in this case. But again, when it comes to the issue of the aql, we, the aql has limits. Therefore, uh, once the aql reaches it, its limit, it should leave whatever is beyond that for the text to be carried on by the text, the Quran and the authentic sunnah. Uh, this is why, like uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, in his book, Dar Ta'arud al-Aql wa naql uh, he gave uh, an example of the relation between the, the aql, the intellect, and the text. And he said, it is like if someone comes to uh, a town, if a stranger comes to a town, and he asks someone, guide me to the most knowledgeable scholar in this town, because I have some fatawa, some verdicts, I need to ask him. So if that person asked, uh, guide him to the scholar. And this stranger goes to the scholar and asks his question. 
to this scholar and he gets an answer from this scholar. He said, if he goes back to the one who guided him to the scholar and says to him, these are the answers of that scholar to me. And if the ask the asked person says to him, well, I disagree with the statements and the answers presented by that scholar. Hence, you should take my answer and ignore the answers of the scholar. Here, the stranger would say to him, no. I mean, he is specialized. He is well known in the topic. Therefore, he has precedence over your uh, views. Uh, if this, the, the one asked, who gave guidance to the stranger said, well, I am the one who had guided you to that scholar. Therefore, if it weren't for me, you would not have been guided to that person. Then I should have precedence in my opinion over the uh, view and the opinion of the scholar. Here we say he is mistaken. And this is like the case and the relation between the aql and the text. The aql had led us that Allah is haq and that Prophet Muhammad is haq and that the Quran is haq and once that happens it stops there after that whatever Allah says to you the aql has nothing to do but to submit in this case once you see a explicit teachings from the Quran and the authentic sunnah presented before people the aql has no say but to submit to the statement of the truth of Allah Azza wa Jal and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the relation between the Aql and the Naql according to Ahlul Sunnah. Uh, if someone says, well, I shall, I shall keep on putting my Aql in every statement said by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, here we say, you may go astray if you persist upon this position because sometimes you may see ayat for instance وَالسَّارِقُ وَالسَّارِقَةُ فَاقْطَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا if someone says well if any aql like we do so these days we have so many people who are not upon Islam and they attack Islam uh, based on such verses that these verses are so brutal therefore it cannot be uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again putting their aql into something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had uh, stated clearly as a ruling against whomever commits such a crime. So in this case, uh, we would see that many intellect, many intellectuals, many uqul may uh, oppose such ayah. Then if we open the door for the aql to be, to involve in every statement said by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then certainly the aql will lead us astray. So this is why these people, like Ahlul Kalam, they had placed their aql into the verses of a sifat, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of their distorted way of thinking, they ended up having an astray uh, way in understanding the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala azza wa jal. And, and let us see how the how they they gave you know precedence to the aql, the intellect over the text. Uh, especially by Fakhruddin al-Razi, Abu Abdullah, who died 606 uh, after Hijrah. Uh, this man, he did, uh, he, he just diverted the Ash'ari Madhab to a greater level in which he had established foundations which glorified the intellect. And he presented argument in which the Ash'ara who came after him leaned immensely upon his arguments to uh, persist upon their position uh, in regards to Allah's attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his, his, uh, and of course he was not the first one to present such an argument. Before him was his Sheikh uh, Al-Ghazali. And uh, I mean, uh, the Ghazali was not his direct sheikh, but he was before him. And before Al-Ghazali was Al-Juwaini, who was the sheikh of Al-Ghazali. They were all following the same way. And of course, before them was Al-Mu'tazila, like Al-Qadi Abdul Jabbar, uh, who died 415 after Hijrah, from the Mu'tazila. So it was way early back that people 
valued the intellect and gave precedence to the intellect. But the, what the Razi did is that he, he, he wrote in his book, the Asis al Taqdis, to uh, establish the foundation of the glorification. What he meant here is Taqdis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his entire argument was, you know, rational argument to come up with the distorted interpretation of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his argument was based on uh, a, a, a law that he established. Uh, they say, Qanun Kulli, a holistic law. And this law was pertaining if two arguments are conflicting. If we have a proof from the Quran and we have a proof from the intellect, a rational proof, a textual proof. If they conflict, whom do we give precedence to? Based on his argument that the aql is qat'i, categorical, and that banas, the text is vanni, non-categorical. So here the aql is explicit in its argument, uh, while the naql text is implicit in its argument. So he said in this case, we, we have four, four uh, uh, probabilities in this case. So either we refuse both of them, both arguments which are conflicting, and this is not uh, logical. We must take one of them. Or we accept both of them. He said this is not logical because they are conflicting. We must take only one. Or he said we give precedence to the text, and naql over the aql, the rational argument. He said this is not correct because and naql the text is vanni, non-categorical, implicit, while the intellect is explicit and categorical. Therefore, we cannot give precedence to the non-categorical over the categorical. Then we should uh, refuse this option to give precedence to the text over the uh, intellect. And finally, he said that the last option is we give precedence to the aql because the aql is the mean in which we have been guided to the naql. He said the aql is the asl, is the foundation for the naql. If, if it weren't for the aql, there would not have been a naql, a text in this case. So look to his argument. And of course, his argument was refuted by Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah from 44 ways. He had 44 arguments refuting the law of Ar-Razi here in As At Asis Al-Taqdis. That's why he wrote his book, Dar Ta'arud Al-Aqr, which is 10 volumes, 10 volumes to debunk and to expose and to refute the law of Ar-Razi in his book, Ta'asis Al-Taqdis. And uh, among the, I mean, simple argument in which Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah uh, just summarized the entire law and how he, he go about uh, refuting this law. He said, we do not compare between the text and the uh, uh, intellect. He said, we rather look to whichever is categorical, al-qat'i. So we have qat'i and we have dhanni, irrespective of whether it was aqli or uh, naqli. So again, Sheikh Islam is saying, we look to the topic from different angle. We look to these two conflicting proofs. In the case of Ar-Razi, he said one is text, the other is the intellect. Sheikh Islam is saying, no, we don't put the text and the, uh, and the uh, intellect uh, only as this is the cases where we have to compare. He said, no. We, we, we look, look at both of them from a different angle where we say that proof is either categorical, meaning qat'i, or dhanni. Therefore, this categorical proof could be too 
rational proofs to uh, arguments which are aqli so if you have two arguments which are both of them qat'i whether both of them were aqli or both of them were naqli or one of them was aqli the other was naqli he said to have two proofs which are contradicting and both of them are categorical this can never happen this can never happen so he's saying irrespective of the type of proof we cannot have two conflicting categorical proofs be it both are rational proofs be it both are textual proofs or one of them is rational the other is textual but he said if we have one of them is categorical and the next is dhanni, non-categorical. Here he said, we always give precedence to the categorical, whether it was textual or rational. So again, whatever is categorical, if the conflicting two proofs, one of them is categorical, the other is non-categorical, he said always the categorical gets precedence whether it was rational proof or textual proof as long as it is categorical it should be given precedence this is why like let me give you an example from from reality these days uh, a contemporary example we do see that um, these days there is an, an argument going around that the earth is flat and this is said even by non-Muslims. In fact, the, the argument was presented first by the non-Muslims these days. And they are questioning uh, that this is a, a conspiracy theory by, the, by NASA and the academia of the West. They are trying, they're trying to deceive people. And there are some, some voices from amongst the Muslims are supporting this position. And they are very few, of course. They are claiming that we have verses from the Quran that support this position that the earth is flat while we see rational proofs uh, empirical proofs uh, had had come with categorical uh, opinion on this position that this earth is sphere it's not flat so we have the science and the intellect are categorical about this specific topic that the earth is sphere while we have some are claiming that the text of the quran is supporting that the earth is the opposite conflicting opinion which is flat again the text that those who are using to imply that the earth is flat is not categorical it's a although we have other proofs from the quran the things that say that the earth is sphere uh, plus the ijma of the ulama al-islam from early days of islam that the earth is sphere so here those who come and bring these two specific arguments the aql and the naql the aql is saying the earth is sphere the naql according to those who had taken this position they say no the, the text says it's it's uh, flat we say we give precedence to the categorical in this case since the aql is categorical it gets the precedent precedence since the text is uh, implied implicit in this regard it's not categorical it does not take precedence so I, according to Ibn Taymiyyah in a very you know clever manner he disproved the entire uh, you know pyramid which Razi had built upon this argument that he just placed the the knuckle and the text into conflict and while Shah Salam Tim said, no, we do, not, we do not look immediately to text and, and aql. We rather look to the whichever is categorical. And whichever is categorical, it gets precedence. Hence, if both arguments which are conflicting, one of them is non-categorical and the other is non-categorical, here we look for other factors to support one of them. Whichever overwins or overweighs the other, it gets the precedence based on uh, other observations or other other uh, proofs to support one of them over the other in this case. So this is how cleverly Sheikh Islam and Taymiyyah 
uh, dismantled and disproved this uh, entire argument of Al-Razi. And in fact, he wrote another, I mean, the, the 10 volumes book of Dar Ta'arud al-Aql al-Nakhl just to refute this statement of Al-Razi that Al-Aql has precedence over Al-Nakhl. While his, the, the book of the Asis al-Taqdis for Al-Razi, Sheikh al-Islam wrote, wrote another book, uh, Talbis al-Jahmiya, which is almost eight volumes to refute the entire book of Al-Razi, Ta'asis al-Taqdis, and the entire topic of Ta'asis al-Taqdis is distorting the uh, interpretation of the ayat of the Sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran uh, based on intellectual and rational arguments, which was strongly disproved by Ibn Taymiyyah. This is one thing, one issue in which, which led to their deviation is giving precedence to the aql over the naql. And we have, and I've mentioned how Shaykh Salam and Taymiyyah went on and disproved this argument. The second issue that led them to uh, distort the interpretation of Allah's attributes Azza wa Jal is they, they presented uh, early by like uh, Al-Ja'ad ibn Dirham who died 105 after Hijrah. And he is actually the, the true founder of Al-Jahmiyyah. His student, Al-Jahm ibn Safwan, who died 128, carried on his teachings and he spread it amongst the people. So this argument uh, that in which the, the uh, Al-Jahm ibn Dirham, ibn Dirham, uh, Al ibn Dirham tried to uh, prove to the philosophers that this entire universe is created, uh, is not uh, daim, it's not eternal. So he came with an argument, logical argument, which at the end it backfired against him. So they 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 brought an argument which is called Dalil uh, al-Arab or Dalil al-Arabi wal ajsam and their, their argument was to try to prove to the philosophers that this universe had a beginning. And what was the way that they used to prove to the philosophers that this world or this universe had a beginning? They used this Dalil, Dalil al-Arab, the uh, argument of the attributes. And the, the, the argument has two premises. The first premise, they say any substance, any body, uh, it, is, it must have attributes or characteristics or qualities. They call it a'rab. And they mean also sifat, attributes. So any existing body or substance, it should have attributes. For instance, the movement of a substance or a body or something. They say this movement is Arab. It's an attribute. Therefore, they say this motion, this movement, it cannot stand on its own. It must reside in a substance or a body in order to take place. So you don't have something called motion separate from an entity. It is part of an entity. So they, so they say, since the attributes and the arab are caused, they are not eternal. Okay? So the second argument is that since the arab are created, caused, and they only stand upon a substance or a body, this leads to the conclusion that this body is also caused, had a beginning. So this argument, when it was presented to the philosophers, they said, yes, this argument makes sense, but now we want you to describe for us your Rabb. So when this was thrown against Al-Jahmiyyah, uh, to try to describe their Rabb, if they go on and they say Allah is a sami the all-hearing, the all-seeing, the one who is pleased, 
the one who gets angry subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on they would say to them those are a'rab meaning attributes which are caused therefore if they are caused Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also according to the philosophers according to this argument Allah is also hadith caused therefore this universe has no creator once this was said to the uh, Jahmiya, they came to a conclusion to negate all of Allah's attributes so the early Jahmiya, they negated all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say we only affirm an existing God who is absolute meaning has no attributes at all so look how the argument backfired at the Islamic position of al jad ibn Dirham and al jad ibn Safwan and how that led them to deny and negate Allah's attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala so because of this we see that this position and this argument of al-arab the dalil al-arab was actually transmitted to the other groups who came after al jahmiyyah the mu'tazila uh, took this argument and this proof they said yes this is the only way to prove that this universe came into existence there is no other way to prove that this universe came into existence and subhanallah how amazing they were so much blind from the you know multitude of diverse proofs in the quran and the authentic sunnah which prove that this world has a beginning subhanallah but they just uh, relied uh, immensely upon this argument and they said that this is the only way to prove that this universe had a beginning so therefore in the first position al jahmiya they said uh, they denied allah's names and attributes they say allah's names are created and the attributes they negated all of the attributes they said we only affirm an existence which is free from any attributes and certainly logically speaking again losing their logic or any human logic how can you have an existing being without any attributes but what's is surprising that this argument uh, resonated and, and, and started to uh, impact those who are around and using Alm al Kalam, the logic way methodology to affirm the Aqidah and the Mu'tazila followed them then the Kullabiyya and the Asha'ira and the Maturidiyya also followed them in the case of the Kullabiyya and the Maturid and the Maturidi and Asha'ira they affirmed only very few attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they said our intellect uh, uh, declares that we must affirm those attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they, they must they must be there uh, logically rationally in this case so they ended up only affirming like in the case of the Asha'ara seven attributes but look how this proof Dalil al-A'rab led those Ahlul Kalam to go astray in regards to Allah's names and attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course based on this argument the Asha'ira and the Maturidi and the others they made it incumbent upon every Muslim they said they said awwal wajibin an nadar the first obligatory act upon every Muslim is to reflect. Some say to, uh, to start to reflect. And some went to extreme, they said, to doubt. And from doubting, you can be led to reflecting and looking and then be guided. And they made this issue incumbent upon every Muslim. So this, no, of course, what they mean by uh, another to look into the proof, they meant the proof of Al-Arab, the Leel Al-Arab, the attributes, the, the proof of the attributes or the Arab that proves to the uh, philosophers that this universe had a beginning in this case. So this is why it is uh, 
I mean, uh, greatly uh, disproved by ulama sunnah to say that the first obligatory act upon mankind to reflect upon this specific proof, this is an issue that has no proof. In fact, we have the entire Sahaba have not even heard about this proof. The entire Tabi'een generation have not even heard about this proof. So how can you claim that this proof, which came way later, is incumbent upon every Muslim? Plus, this proof is so complex. Even the Ahlul Kalam themselves, they went into different conflicting opinions on this specific argument, the Dil Arad. If this is the case, if you yourself who have that level of high intellect are getting into this level of uh, disagreement, then how can you make it incumbent upon every Muslim to look into this proof in this case? So this is why when you look how the intellect of those people had led them really away from the teachings of the Quran and the authentic Sunnah, once you understand your, their position, you'll understand and appreciate why Ibn Taymiyyah had to write 10 volumes? Why Ibn Qayyim had to write so many volumes in this topic? Why the other scholars of Islam had to mention so many in their Aqaid book this specific topic? We have taken the uh, Lum'at al atiqad for Ibn Qudama. You have seen that a big portion of the book was focusing upon the issue of Allah's attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reason that these people who gave precedence to the intellect had really diverted so many people from the true teachings and understanding of Aqeedah according to the Sahaba and the generations who came after them. A third way in which that had led those people to go astray, and this position is, is a result of their previous arguments, giving precedence to the Aql, using the real Arab, to negate Allah's attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala is the issue of rejecting a hadith al-ahad rejecting a hadith al-ahad so uh, when we look to the hadith of the prophet peace be upon him uh, the hadith is either mutawatir or ahad the hadith mutawatir are actually so little in the sunnah what we mean by al-mutawatir here is that to have a hadith in which in every level of the chain of narrators it was narrated by a big group of people in which it is impossible upon them to calibrate and come together to lie about the prophet peace be upon him so this is the hadith mutawatir anything which which does not meet this criteria they say it's hadith ahad so they they stipulated that you must have in every level of the chain of narrators a big group of people in order for the hadith to be accepted. And like we look, if we look into the Sharia, we would see that there are so many ahadith which are ahad in aqeedah, in ahkam, in adab, in akhlaq, in everything. The majority of the ahadith are ahad, but they were proven that they are authentic and sound based on the uh, you know criterion placed by the specialized of the specialized in this specific field. That they came into conclusion this hadith is sound this hadith is is weak and so on so once the hadith is sound even if it is classified as a had the ulama they say we take a ruling from it but those of ahl kalam they say no we cannot take a hadith a had in the issue of aqidah therefore based on this opinion of theirs they rejected so many ahadith that talks about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, we may see even the Mu'tazila going to extreme to deny many of the ahadith that talks about the hereafter or talks about what goes in the grave or talks about the major signs of the hour. They rejected many of those ahadith uh, using the argument that this uh, ahadith are ahad. So again, this is one of the main reasons they rejected the ahadith, the, 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 uh, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, especially, we find in the sunnah, many ahadith are mentioned regarding the 
attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is a, in, a, in a summary, of course, the issue of the intellect and the text and these specific uh, listed uh, reasons for their deviance. We see that big, big books are written uh, refuting the position of these people. In fact, the issue of Hadith Ahad, if you look into the book of uh, Shafi al Risala, he was among the first to present so many arguments uh, disproving uh, such argument, rejecting a Hadith al Ahad. So when it comes to the hadith, the book of uh, Shaykh Ibn Uthameen, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, Al-Qawaid Al-Muthla, uh, the way, inshallah ta'ala, in which we'll go over the book, uh, I'll be reading the principle itself, and then try to summarize the uh, statement of the author. I will not go verbatim over every uh, single word said by Ibn Uthameen, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, but we'll read the principle itself, and we'll try to summarize the argument presented by him rahmatullah alayh, and shed maybe some more uh, notes here and there uh, also we need to understand the structure of the book uh, here presented by sheikh ibn Uthim, rahmatullah alayh. Uh, the sheikh had mentioned uh, firstly seven principles pertaining allah's names and then he mentioned seven principles pertaining allah's attributes and then he mentioned four principles pertaining the proofs used from the Quran the Sunnah to affirm the names and the attributes. And after that, he presented doubts presented by Ahl Kalam uh, regarding some of the ahadith of the Sifat and how Ahl Sunnah had refuted those who had gone astray uh, in this regard. So at the end of the book, he mentions some of the uh, ahadith and how Ahl Sunnah dealt with these ahadith. So let us go over the uh, book of Shaykh Ibn Uthameen Rahmatullah Alayh. Uh, the Shaykh started by the introduction, which is very important. And he mentioned uh, uh, some issues, which is uh, very uh, important for us to be aware of. He started by praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the Exalted. And then uh, he mentioned that to believe in Allah's names and attributes is one of the pillars of believing in Allah's or one of the pillars pertaining Allah Azza wa Jal. So to believe in Allah, to believe in, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it, uh, it means that we, we believe in His existence, we believe in His Rububiyyah, we believe in His Uluhiyyah, and we believe in His names and attributes. So the names and attributes are one of the pillars of believing uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, uh, the issue of the first one to believe in his existence we as students of knowledge these days uh, with the vicious onslaught against the muslim youth especially in this specific topic our youngsters especially those who are living in non-muslim countries have so many doubts thrown at them questioning the basics of the basics which is Allah's existence and poor kids in many cases they go back home live with the with parents who are lay people they cannot find anyone to talk to to discuss this topic with and to present their doubts in order to get the right answers so it is it is really incumbent upon us students of knowledge to spread the arguments which support Allah's existence. Yes, this issue was was not something people thought of a few decades back. It was something which uh, it's it's within the innate of every being that Allah exists. But the 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 ugly and wicked argument presented by the atheists and the agnostics these days, uh, it is uh, sugar coated, in which the people who are uh, ignorant or have minimal knowledge in their sharia in islam and so on they get deceived easily by such arguments this is why you may find arabic speaking youth living in mecca itself declaring that they are atheists why is that they've been bombarded day and night by such arguments by them going into sites and watching 
you know, videos and, 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 and some of the atheists throwing their doubts without going and referring to the scholars or to the students of knowledge on how to refute such arguments. So we need to understand in details the proofs of Allah's existence. And let me just uh, quickly go over the, the headings of some of these arguments. One argument is Dalilul Khalq wal Ijad, the proof of existence. And it is related to the uh, the Sadabiyya, the, the law of uh, causality, that every caused thing must have a cause. We see that the entire universe is caused. In fact, the, the, the West, the Academia in West, had came almost to a consensus that this entire universe had a beginning. Then who caused it? Because every cause, every caused thing must have a cause. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, like in Surah al tur in two verses summarized this entire argument. Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in. Am humul khaliqun. Were they created out of nothing or did they create themselves? Am khalaqu samawati wal arda? Bal la yuqinun. Or did they create the heavens and the earth, certainly uh, they are not certain. So the Quran has so many, by the way, logical arguments. This is one of them. And all the arguments I'm going to present right now are taken from the Quran itself. We don't need to go to invent new philosophical argument, which may backfire at us, like the Dalil al-A'rab used by the Ahl al-Kalam, we have enough logical arguments within the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. The second proof, Dalil al itqan al ihkam the proof of you know perfection that we see around us. Perfection entails a perfecter. So this perfection that we see around us, this itqan, this preciseness of the entire universe, of the existing beings and their creation. It entails that there is someone who did all that, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, also, the third argument, the argument of al-hidayah wal-inayah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had guided every created being, uh, uh, how to live its life, how to procreate, how to f find its way of provision. When you look to the multitude of creation, you get fascinated by how every creature exists and find his way to survive and exist and how this ecosystem serve each other at the end subhanallah so this hidayah we have so many stories from every creature uh, how it it procreates and how it it finds its way in, in in provision in a very you know fascinated way you see that a newborn who from the human beings or any other creature from day one knows what to do. Who instilled that information into such creature? So this is issues which science cannot answer, subhanAllah. The fourth argument is the uh, innate disposition that al-fitra cries out loud that there is a creator. This is why there is a statement said there are no atheists in the foxholes, meaning that in, in a battlefield, when the soldiers are hiding in holes from the shooting of the enemies, if a soldier was an atheist in that position, he find himself rushing and running swiftly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking him for survivor and help. This is why we have so many stories like Cat Stevens, and others, and we have the uh, Dr. Lawrence Brown, who also mentions his amazing story with his daughter, uh, who was who was born with with the heart defects, and she was about to die, and he was an atheist, and he, he, he mentions his story, go search his story, you'll be surprised how the fitra works, and how uh, one is at the whenever is inflicted by a calamity, he, he, he immediately runs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any question, subhanAllah. And other argument, the fifth argument is the moral argument. We see that human are 
like like they are uh, hard wired with morals who instilled such morals in human being the atheists try to throw argument that morals are subjective meaning that people come it is a social consensus in which they come to an agreement that this moral value we agree to have it practiced and applied in our community if if this is the case if morals are subjective so if in your community becomes permissible you may see other communities violating your values and your morals so hence how come do we see in reality all mankind come into consensus that some issues are immoral uh, for instance lying killing unjustly uh, uh, deceiving people and so on such issues by consensus everyone wherever you go people agree that this is wrong and and it's not uh, just and so on so morally speaking uh, we have so much argument if you look inshallah i'll try to share with you some some uh, flow charts that summarize this argument in which you can use uh, for you to to refer to additionally we can use in addition to that we can use the uh, the uh, the arguments of prophethood to support allah's existence so every argument that you use that that the prophet muhammad is a true prophet is also an argument that you can use for allah's existence also every argument that you may use for the divinity of the quran to prove the divinity of the quran you can use to substantiate the existence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so again the issue this issue uh, and, and and sisters akhawat it's very very crucial these days that the student of knowledge give precedence especially we should check for the youngsters around us and try to share as much information over the internet to have it handy and available for people to get access to and then he mentioned uh, rahimullah ta'ala that tawheed allah azza wa jal to attain the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of three type he mentions tawheed al rububiyyah tawheed al uluhiyah wa tawheed al asma al sifat and he mentioned that it's not possible for anyone to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without understanding and knowing allah's attributes azza wa jal if we do not understand Allah's attributes in a manner that befits His Majesty, certainly we will not worship Him the, the, the way He deserves the exalted He is. Allah said, Subhanahu wa Taala, like the Sheikh mentioned, "Wallahi al-asma al-husna fadhuhu biha." To Allah belongs all the all beautiful names, so call Him with it. Meaning, use His names to call Him with it, Subhanahu wa Taala. And of course, calling Allah Subhanahu wa Taala it includes Dua al-Mas'ala and Dua al-Ibadah. Dua al-Mas'ala to use Allah's names in your Mas'ala and your uh, request from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the name that befits your need that you are presented that you are presenting when you are calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, you may say, Ya Ghafoor, O oh, you oft forgiving, forgive me. If you are asking for mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is befitting to say, Ya Rahman, Irhamni, O you, all merciful, have mercy upon me. If you are asking for provision, then it is befitting to call him by his name, Ar Razzaq. Ya Allah, Ya Razzaq, O you, the all provider, provider, provide for me, and so on. And Dua al Ibadah to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while attending in your mind and understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are practicing, for instance, when you are, when you attend in your mind and your heart that Allah is the all hearing, you will certainly be very careful for every statement that comes out of your mouth. Once you understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all watching, you will be so careful not to be in a place uh, or do an act which uh, does not please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is all watching over you, the exalted he is. And then the Sheikh mentioned the reason for writing this book of his, Rahmatullah And 
He said, because the statement of people in any issue, it is sometimes truthful and sometimes it is not correct. And the reason behind going astray from the haq and the truth could be because of ignorance or because of bigotry. Those who are ignorant, because of their ignorance, they may utter things which are not truthful or wrong. And those who are bigots in whatever they take position in, because of this bigotry, they may end up standing firm, holding a specific position, which may be against the truth in this case. So inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll stop here today. And I had to go through, through this uh, introduction uh, because it is, it is very, very crucial that we understand that issue before delving into the topic of the book. So, uh, Barakallah Fikum, Barakallah Fikum, wa Jazakum Allah Khaira, wa Sallallahu Ala Nabina Muhammad wa Ala Alihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam. Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh.